Yep. Great. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, um, public lectures of the Tech Talks, uh, which this semester focus on uh, uh, material cities and ethics. And uh, please join me in welcoming Alison Mears and Sara Ruth, uh, uh, who will be presenting today their work on healthy materials. Um, Alison Mears is an, art, is an architect, associate professor of architecture, and director and co-founder of Healthy Materials Lab. She is co-principal investigator of the Healthy Affordable Materials Project, a three-year project funded by the JP, uh, JPB Foundation, recently refunded for an additional three years until 2021. Uh, the project is a coalition of four organizations who work together to detoxify the interior environments of affordable housing. Alison Mears uh, focuses her research on design strategies that disrupt the building supply chain to incorporate human health as criteria for evaluating building products. Previously, uh, she served as the Parsons Dean of the School of Design Strategies and Director of the BFA Architectural Design and Interior Design Programs. She teaches architectural design studios at Parsons focused on building urban and community issues. And she's currently a partner um, in the architectural practice Patchy Plus Mirrors Architects PC. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you, Alison, for joining today. And uh, for Junsara Ruth, uh, um, let me introduce Junsara. Junsara is a designer, artist, and design director at Healthy Materials Lab. She is founding director of the Progressive MFA Interior Design Program at Parsons School of Design. Uh, charged with provoking change in the field, she leads After Taste, an annual symposium drawing from perspective from a wide spectrum of disciplines to bring new definition to the field of interiors. In her teaching, uh, Junsara draws from practices at both their cutting edges and their ancestral roots to inform design approaches. Her ideas about designing interior environments focus on exploring and understanding human experience. As a designer, she is committed to using materials and processes that maximize worker, end user, and planetary health. So currently, Junsara uh, leads Salty Labs, a collaborative design studio founded in sustainable thinking and testing experimental methodologies. And uh, she was the first lead designer uh, for the Martha Stewart Signature Furniture Collection, and her work uh, is seen in hundreds of retail venues, thousands of homes, exhibited in galleries and museums, uh, featured in publications internationally, and has received multiple awards. Uh, Junsari is also a fellow at the McDowell Colony, uh, received a Master's of Architecture from Cranbrook Academy of Art and a BFA in Industrial Design from Rhode Island School of Design. Um, Jansara and Allison's lecture today will be moderated by Catherine Murphy, an adjunct faculty with us at GSAP, who teaches the Healthy Building Materials class. Um, uh, she also teaches at the New School. Uh, she's trained as an artist and designer. Um, um, so Catherine's interior design practice is dedicated to making physical spaces healthier for everyone. She responds to the history of the place and the client rather than adhering to a signature style. Her practice is rooted in craft making and the inherent potential of materials in their pursuit and healthier states. So join me in welcoming uh, Junsara and Ellison. I'm delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, Lola. It's great to be here. It's great to be with all of you. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak. So um, I'm John Sara, and my partner Allison um, will soon be on the screen. Um, we are co-founders of Healthy Materials Lab at Parsons. Um, I think that maybe our screen view. I don't know if you can see us. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. So so thanks very much for inviting us here today. Um, next slide, thanks, Catherine. We wanted to emphasize the fact that we are co-founders and we are co-directors and, and collaboration is something that we emphasize in our work. And our, um, our uh, lab is a combination of full-time design researchers, educators, 
communications experts and research assistants, and some recent um, design graduates. And we come from a range of disciplines, as do our advisors that you'll see there on the right. Next slide, please. We established Healthy Materials Lab in 2015, as we mentioned earlier. We are going, today we're going to introduce or um, maybe reintroduce for some of you who are familiar with this work, the topic of material health and common building products and why this research, our own research, um, leads us on a journey to look for alternative construction products. Next slide. To be able to do our interdisciplinary work, we and our partners, Healthy Building Network, Green Science Policy Institute, and Health Product Declaration Collaborative are supported by a generous grant from the JPB Foundation. Next, yeah, thank you. We have a number of projects running simultaneously in the lab, from educational programming to publications and research. Next slide. In communications, the website and, and podcasts, we share the, share the work we create and educate and advocate for change. And we regularly publish our work. There are few design programs that include material health content in the US and, and elsewhere. Columbia does now, thanks to Catherine and the work of Lola. Over the past three years, we've created two online programs taught by 55 to 60 experts in the field and a number of short courses to help designers change their practice. Next slide. We work to translate scientific and public health data to make it accessible and not and actionable by both architects and designers like ourselves, and to create new knowledge. In the UVC project, as something that we may talk about later, we're exploring, exploring how germicidal UV light can be used to retrofit existing lights to work with ventilation to deactivate COVID. We also look to change architect, architecture and design practice with resources to help that transition to health, healthy material specifications or to proto, prototype new forms of building. Next slide. At HML, we research and collaborate with a broad range of experts exploring this relationship, this complex relationship between human health and building materials. During COVID, it's been revealed that the compounded inequities and trauma of our current systems, many of these complicated systems that we are part of, reveal that diverse communities that are now at compounded risk. Next slide, please. So we see ourselves as a city, we in the buildings, all of us are the city and our actions as, and architects, as architects and designers have impacts on everyone. But the most profound impacts we can have as designers are on the most vulnerable. Next slide. We make the direct connection between the carbon emitted in, in the production of petrochemicals and the specification of petrochemically based building products, an obvious connection. Reducing the use of these building products reduces carbon emissions. Next, please. And we also make this connection between those products and our health. So not only are the products derived from petrochemicals bad for the environment, but but they are also harmful for us. These materials shed, these building materials that we use shed and release these chemicals into our built environments, which are then absorbed and become part of our bio biological systems. Next, please. These indoor spaces where we spend so much time now more than ever are filled with invisible chemical hazards, making our indoor air three to five times more toxic than our polluted outdoor air. Many of the chemicals that we use are not regulated. And this is a surprise for people who are unfamiliar with this topic. Only 250 of these 85,000 chemicals currently in use are tested, and only five of them have been partially restricted by law. Many of these chemicals are toxic and become part of our, everybody's biology. That means our bodies, they're embedded in our bodies. Next, please. Over time, um, materials and products break down and the chemicals are released through off-gassing as particles or as dust, or as chemicals become unbound and released into our, into our environment. Next, please. Once these chemicals are loose in the interior space, we breathe them in, we can eat them, or they could be absorbed through our skin. Next slide, please. Our partners at Green Science Policy have come up with a system to understand the worst classes of chemicals so that we can work to remove these six classes from common products. Next slide. 
We also understand that it's not, not just about our environmental exposure, but there are genetics in our body, our biological systems are part of this same complex issue. So this problem of chemicals in our built environment, how does it actually impact our health? Um, research, this research study called the Exposome Project has identified that genetics determines only 10% of human diseases with the environment accounting for the other 90%. Next, please. The exposome can be defined as a measure of all of our exposures, all of these environmental exposures, chemical exposures of an individual in a lifetime, and how those exposures relate and trigger particular health conditions. Next, please. And what triggers these 90%, um, these other 90% of diseases, what makes us most vulnerable to um, diseases through exposure? And these, I'm sure most of you are aware of these, these remaining causes are triggered by the social determinants of health, the economic and social conditions that determine individual and group differences in health. Where these social determinants are disrupted due to poverty, for example, diseases such as asthma, obesity, and diabetes are triggered in those individuals. Next, please. In the current crisis, the rates of COVID are located, um, are tied to the same undeserved and marginalized communities that been, have been subjected to decade, decades of environmental and systemic racism. And so this is really critical, making the link between poverty and rates of COVID and rates of disease. Next slide, please. And you see this in these two research studies, whether we are, more, we are more vulnerable to the novel coronavirus if our defenses have been compromised by chronic illnesses like cancer, diabetes, or asthma. And experts have found these and other health problems are linked to exposure to toxic chemicals in our buildings. Again, it's in the BIPOC communities that have been hardest hit because of their social determinants of health. Next, please. So it's critical that we build healthier and more resilient communities. Dramatically reducing people's exposure to harmful chemicals is an issue of equity, both equity and public health, um, to protect those who have suffered because of these generations of institutionalized racism. Next, please. Many of the products that are typically used in current construction, these normal banal products that we take for granted, contain the chemicals that are linked to human disease. In our work, we look to remove these chemicals and propose viable, affordable, and benign alternatives. Jansara? So what if we look at a seemingly simple product like paint? You know, we could have looked at plywood or any of those that Allison just mentioned, but if we look at paint, you know, we know that it can create benign, beautiful spaces but paint can also be seriously harmful. Sorry, next slide, please. Such as the lead paint that's still used in many homes across the country, like here in NYCHA housing, these are photos of the lead paint. Next. Um, paints cover, next slide, please. The paints cover most of the surfaces and interiors. Um, many of the currently petrochemically based acrylic paints contain a wide range of toxic chemicals from VOCs to APEs to common ingredients that make up the paint. We understand that while this, the Center for Disease Control might give a recommendation of five parts per million as being a guideline for lead exposure, there's actually no safe level of lead that really we're so susceptible to lead in anything. Next, please. The first experience we have of paint is when we take off the lid and we have that first paint smell, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. That's filled with VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Next, please. The second experience with our paint is, is when it's been dried and it starts to degrade as the dust, as dust into the interior spaces. And then we can inhale it from the air that we're breathing. Next, please. So um, where are our interiors and how did we get to this point? If we go to the next slide, you will see that there are four basic components to paint. So we're, we're just going to look more deeply into paint itself. There's binders, solvents, pigments, and additives. And that's, those are the ingredients that conventional paint are made of. So let's, let's go into those. Uh, next slide, please. 
The binders are the um, substance that hold together all of the different ingredients in the paint or coating to form a continuous film that adheres to surfaces. And that's what we know as, as paint. But um, synthetic binders are often called resins. And there are many types of resins that you see here in this list, including acrylic and vinyl, which are basically plastics. Next, please. So um, the chemicals that, that put together a binder um, can be a monomer. And here's where we go into chemistry and we'll have to rely on some of the high school chemistry here. But um, a monomer is a, a link that's, that's not so tight. And so a molecule can, can disengage from that coating and shed into this from the interior surface, fall into the air, the indoor air, and even drop to the floor where people spend a lot of our time, especially small people like children. And then they breathe in these, these molecules. Next slide, please. The next category in paint, um, next substance category is solvents. So the purpose of solvents or the performance of solvents is that they're used to mix all of the ingredients of paints and coatings to make the coating fluid. And that fluidity allows us to apply the paint to a wall, for instance. Um, but many of the synthetic solvents that, we, that are used in paint um, are volatile organic compounds or VOCs, um, which, which we know can affect us biologically. Next, please. And in the mid 20th century, the, the VOC reduction began to be the driver in the coatings industry because there was recognition that the ozone layer was being destructed and that was linked to these VOC emissions. So VOCs have begun to be regulated and you'll, you'll notice that on um, uh, you know, low VOC or no VOC paints. Next slide, please. Um, Another category, the third category that we talked about is pigments. So pigments is what give paint color. And maybe that's pretty obvious. Pigments provide color and opacity actually to um, any kind of coating, but also to paints. But you know, synthetic pigments have replaced many of the naturally occurring pigments that have been used historically. And synth synthetic pigments were, were used to, um, to develop coverage and colors that were difficult to achieve originally with, with natural pigments. One example is for instance, titanium dioxide was um, a white pigment that replaced white lead carbonate. So we, it used to be that white paint was lead and then it switched to titanium dioxide because not because people were trying to get rid of lead unfortunately, but because instead titanium dioxide actually is a much more opaque coating um, and it, it made that white more opaque. Um, but of course, titanium dioxide isn't such a great substance either. It's also known as a carcinogen. Um, but so many of the other pigments also contain VOCs, which can be harmful to human health, triggering things like asthma and sometimes cancer. Next slide, please. And additives are the last of the four categories of, of the ingredients in paint. Additives are the materials that are included in smaller quantities to modify some property of this coating. So one example of, a, of an additive is called an APE um, or alkaphenol um, xylates. And these are used to emulsify all of the, the ingredients in paint and make it nice and smooth. But recently this group of chemicals has been linked with endocrine disruption in people's bodies, causing problems such as obesity, diabetes, male reproductive disorders, or even altered brain development. And so this is kind of alarming news about paint. Next, please. So, so these are the general um, ingredients in conventional paint, um, which we can, we can look at again here. And this is what we know of as paint. And you know, one of the, one of the uh, misnomers is we call it latex paint, but actually it's not latex at all. It's actually acrylic or vinyl or some kind of plastic. It's synthetic plastic that comes from a petrochemical base. Next slide, please. So what we did, is we just said, well, let's look historically. Let's see the way that the paint used to be made. And so um, we can see that um, historically and in these ancient cave paintings in France, paint was made of natural materials. They were made of stone. Um, and of fats. And the binders were actually fats where the pigments were ground up stone. Next slide, please. Later, um, it was found that 
in the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans that their binders were actually from animal bones or from beeswax or from eggs. And then they used water as the solvent. And the pigments were again, these three basic primary colors, which were ground up minerals. And so that was the, the ingredients in, in ancient paint. Um, next slide, please. In Italy, um, there was another kind of paint where the binder was actually lime putty made from limestone. And again, those three basic pigments were used to make color and those pigments were minerals and water remained as the solvent. Next slide, please. Here we are now on this continent in early um, colonial America, the paints, that, the paints were um, used binders that could easily be found in the landscape. So the chickens provided the egg yolks and plants and nuts provided the oils um, for the binder itself. Next slide, please. So, you know, if we look just historically prior to say the, the 1940s or 50s, we can see that there were three basic categories of binders of paints. There was oil, oil-based paints, water-based paints, and um, lime or milk-based components. And the, the milk-based is actually, um, lime and milk are mixed, but the, the milk, it's um, the casein, which is a, casein is a protein that's found in milk. And that was used as the binder. Next slide, please. But um, there have been dramatic changes in the composition of paint, which began in the Industrial Re Revolution, when the synthetic polymer binders were introduced. And these synthetic pigments were also introduced. And then synthetic solvents were developed to mix all these synthetic ingredients together so that they would feel like one cohesive thing. And then there were additives. Um, and the additives were something, all kinds of additives. Another additive was a chemical preservative so that it was invented so you could put a can of paint on a shelf in a retail store and it would last for a very long time. And you could imagine what would happen if you put eggs on a shelf or a milk on a shelf for a very long time. So these chemical preservatives were added to the paint. Next slide, please. But the legacy of these chemicals used in paint production was never addressed. And frontline communities that surround the industries that make these chemicals saw rising levels of cancer and asthma rates. Next slide, please. So, you know, this is where this is where, where our work comes in, where we look at the comparison, we're comparing. So we look on the left, we see a list of ingredients in typical low or no VOC paint, house paint, where, which is, you know, we, you know they, it's promoted as being so much better, but we see these ingredients and many that we can't pronounce. Um, and then the colors, um, if you can see on that slide, the colors indicate the, the substances used in paint that actually are linked to human health effects from those ingredients. And then if you look on the right in historic lime wash, um, which is now actually this um, is, is a, a paint that's being produced now, that's a lime wash being produced now. And it has three ingredients plus one other ingredient to keep the binder a little bit um, more flexible. Um, but you know, it's, it's very similar to the way we think about packaged food, for instance, if you see a lot of ingredients and ones that you can't pronounce, it's probably not good for you. Um, but there, so there are alternatives here. Next slide, please. And currently, these are you know some current natural binders that are used in paint. We talked about them. There, there's a casein paints, the milk protein, or natural latex actually, because natural latex comes from trees, um, unlike the acrylic paints that we know now. Oils that comes from um, plants and trees, limestone makes lime as was just used as a binder and linseed oil, which comes from the flax, flax plant. Next slide, please. And now there's um, the natural pigments next um, have been now available. And there's a much broader variety as humans have developed. We have many more colors that are actually come from minerals. And so there are, there are all alternatives. And I think that's what we're coming to. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, we know that water can be a great solvent for many things. And if we, this deep dive into paint just reinforces the fact that transforming one product category can actually make a big difference, but it requires a radical upheaval of an industry and changes to specifications and to thinking, material thinking and practice. 
next slide, please. So okay. we know that we can we can use healthier paint alternatives. We can uncover those alternatives and we can start to use them. And they have, you know, in, in many cases, better performance characteristics of pet petrochemically derived um, paints. But how do we make systemic transformational change in architecture, design, and construction to completely change the way we build a wall, for example? Next slide, please. A typical wall section in the US has seven or more ingredients, many of which are made of the same petrochemicals we discussed earlier, those that are most harmful to human health. Next slide, please. Even gypsum wallboard, one of the most ubiquitous building materials in, is seldom 100% gypsum. It often contains fly ash and carries traces of heavy materials like mercury. We always imagine that gypsum is such a benign product, but then it's the additives that are, are problematic. Next slide, please. Faced with all of the problems associated with chemicals in common building products, we look for alternatives. And through this, we've discovered hempcrete or hemp lime. Next slide, please. With hemp lime, the typical wall section can be simplified to three layers of breathable, safe materials, all of them derived from hemp, lime, or water in different proportions. Next slide, please. The benefits of building with hemp and lime are impressive, and it's a healthier alternative to typical building materials. This material also brings together a lot of goals in one place with the potential to make systemic change in a range of industries. So if we look at the list of characteristics of hemp and lime, it's recyclable and biodegradable. It regulates indoor humidity and climate. It's a natural carbon sink. It create, is an energy efficient insulation. It's naturally fire resistant without any added flame retardants. It's mold and pest resistant without any additives. And it, it lasts for a very, very long time. Next slide, please. So we tend to look at these systems. Systems are kind of characteristic of, of the lab. And we're really looking to see how we could perhaps um, propose a new regenerative construction system that could be derived from materials that have beneficial properties. We want to understand how this system might be created, what the roadblocks might be to adop adoption, and how we might act to create new connections. If we think about the social determinants of health, for example, what makes a healthier life? It's more than just the materials that make up your home. Looking at the whole life cycle of hemp and lime and the systems of production that support this kind of building, we see that people and whole communities can benefit from this system. Next slide, please. We start with the transformation of architectural practices where industrial hemp can regenerate the soil. With a developed hemp lime building industry, that creates a market for the product that is um, grown in the fields, people can remain employed and make a living on the land. Next slide, please. A new industry, sorry, Catherine. next slide, please. A new industry can support job creation and facilities which process fiber hemp, for example. Next slide, please. And more potential jobs with facilities that produce hemp line building products. Next slide, please. There could be workforce development in the masonry trades, and there will be a revival of voc vocational training for masons and plasterers. So there's a whole um, labor component of this system that is critically important where new, new jobs are created within the system. Next slide, please. We begin our study of the transformation of construction and housing in a small city in Western Pennsylvania, Newcastle, a, commu a commercial center of a fertile agricultural region. And like many small cities in that region, its heyday was in the early part of the 20th century when industry was booming. Now it's home to many old houses in need of rehabilitation and ready for new industry. Next slide. There's a potential to renovate existing abandoned framed houses. Renovation has a relatively low carbon footprint compared to new construction. And in small towns and cities in the Northeast, where much of the existing housing stock is built, built at the turn of the century, excuse me, <clears throat> from wooden 
from wood using balloon frame construction, hemp lime can be used not only as a healthier insulation material, but also to help add fire resistance to these buildings. The whole system of hemp and lime building materials has the potential to enhance people's lives through job creation, nourishing the environment, creating better, healthier homes for all people. So this is our vision, next slide please. And also the vision of a small, local, powerful, affordable housing provider in Newcastle, Don Services. They see hemp line building and the whole system which fuels them as an opportunity for Newcastle and for the development of affordable housing at large. Next slide, please. So we're architects and designers and we believe that our work is to design healthier spaces for everyone. We're also professors teaching the next generation of architects and designers. And we believe that it's critical that all of us address the largest systemic issues of our time through design practice. Last, next slide, please. Next slide, Catherine, if you can. Thank you. So last winter, we teamed up with faculty and students from Parsons Architecture Programs and with Laurie Datner at Don Services in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Next slide. We began with a workshop in January 2020 when we could be together pre-COVID to introduce the students to the material qualities of hemp lime in a full day hemp lime workshop. This was a first step for students who would explore this novel building material as a focus for their design uh, studio projects for the rest of the spring semester. Next slide, please. This was a rare chance for architecture students who seldom have the opportunity to experiment with materials at full scale or explore buildings, building with natural materials. Next slide, please. At the workshop, the students were able to understand the physical qualities of hemp lime casting processes and block making. This ignited ideas for students whose next step was to propose designs for affordable housing in Newcastle. Next slide, please. The Master of Architecture students continued their design process with fundamental demographic research of Newcastle to understand the basics of cost of living, housing and the median incomes in this area. And this, um, this small city has many of the same characteristics of a lot of the post-industrial cities of the Rust Belt with very low incomes, abandonment, um, low employment, um, low cost of housing. Next slide, please. Focusing on affordability, students explored construction costs to compare savings for renovation versus new construction, as well as to find savings which could be allocated um, for hemp lime construction materials and fabrication. There's a minimum savings of 43% of the total construction costs for renovation versus new, versus new construction, a savings in dollars as well as a in carbon emissions. And some of the this savings could be dedicated to the implementation of hemp lime materials and construction, which still comes at a premium. Next slide. With the goal of uh, scaling hemp lime construction into a mainstream method for renovation, students made this critical comparison between construction timelines for cast in place uh, hemp lime versus pre-cast hemp lime materials. They determined that one month could be saved if pre-cast materials are used. And this is critical in the construction process, obviously, to be able to you know, meet traditional construction practices. Next slide, please. Students were asked to design homes on lots on one city block that addressed the future of the American home and that could accommodate multi-generational living, be built affordably, be fully accessible and produced detailed construction drawings using hemp lime materials and techniques. At the, next slide, please. At the end of the semester, there were some enticing proposals and some extraordinary learning for both the students and faculty who were wrestling with drawing details for hemp line construction. This proposal called House with Two Porches proposed by Samuel Wilson is a simple form that can fit into a variety of residential plots with a simple interior layout to address the needs of a variety of fam um, family types. Next, please. This proposal called Rafter House by Meryl Smith 
creatively takes the ubiquitous roof line shape of American houses and extrudes it along the narrow site to create generous indoor and outdoor spaces that are fully accessible. Next slide, please. Each student's project resulted in unique insights into designing with hemp line. This new, new material also challenged and inspired the faculty who were learning alongside the students. Next slide, John Sarah. Yeah, so it, you know, it's not just the adoption of a new building material that's required to make change. As Allison was saying, we actually look, we act, our work is really about making systemic change and, and that's the, the goal of Don Services as well. So we're looking at supporting agriculture, creating new industry, building workforce, creating new work for the masonry trades, which are kind of dying at the moment in, in the United States and reducing carbon emissions in total. Um, so, you know, that's, that's our major interest here. Next slide, please. Um, at Don Services, they are, have the same goal. And it's, so it's pretty amazing to work with them. They've decided to work on two areas um, to make this change. One is the cultivation of industrial hemp. Next slide. Um, and it, so at Don Services, they work with local farmers and began growing hemp in 2019, just when it, it began um, to be legal in this country. And they, be, they planted hemp in Western Pennsylvania. This is Mike um, holding their very first and only bale from four acres. <laughs> and so as many of you might guess, beginning a new venture is tough and it requires a lot of trial and error. Next slide, please. But um, just this past summer in 2020, um, being outside was pretty great in 2020. Um, it was a better year for, for the crop and they, Don Services received a grant which supported education for hemp farming, assisting farmers to plant hemp in four counties. The six participants were chosen from a list of 59 interested farmers and to test the planting methods. And they planted 14 acres, experimented with two seed varieties and tested planting methods with grain drills and with broadcasting. Next slide, please. The harvest yield was about 77 small square bales. So they're getting better. And, um, and 16 large round bales of hemp. Next slide, please. Don Services collaborated with Hemp Wood, which is a company that makes wood out of like a planks really out of, of hemp. Um, and so they're making this, some of their harvest into flooring, which will be ready to install in the new Pennsylvania hemp home, which is also pretty exciting. We're gonna use their crop as the product materials. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is the other pathway that we're exploring, which is how do we accelerate the production of local lime as well? into so that we can mix hemp and lime um, so that we can make viable construction materials. Next slide, please. So we, here's when we turn to our colleague, Cameron McIntosh, also from Pennsylvania and another partner on the Pennsylvania Hemp Home Project with Don Services. Uh, Cameron, on the, on the right, you'll see Cameron was also um, a guest this summer on our podcast talking about his construction practices using hemp lime. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of an insight into Cameron's work, he's developing techniques for renovation with hemp lime materials by combining several different techniques. Here on the left, you'll see he's using the Ereasy spray technology with, um, with the Ereasy bait, um, uh, binder mix. They're both distributed in the US um, by a, a company called Hempitecture, but it, so we're still importing a lot of the best materials for hemp lime from Europe, specifically from France. Um, and that we're looking to change that and really make it locally. But at the moment, the best quality materials are from France. But um, this kind of spray technology is a great option for renovations. And it will be the, the technique that we use in Newcastle. Um, this spray system reduces labor and time by actually by 60%. So it's pretty, it's really efficient. Next slide, please. So in, in order to demonstrate the material interactions and cross sections of this upcoming renovation, Cameron and his team create full-scale mock-ups um, to just show the code enforcement officials um, what a new wall section might look like and how it would perform with hemp lime. Because, you know, code officials are not used to this material and uh, we, we have to act as advocates for the material itself. And um, as my, so many of you might know, full-scale mock-ups are really incredibly valuable. Next slide, please. So the question is how close are we to bringing um, the whole system 
to fruition in the United States. Um, and this is why and, and what we're exploring with um, Dawn Services in Newcastle, to explore what the roadblocks might be and to prove that we can do this. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, thankfully, Dawn was, was awarded with a, a $75,000 grant from the, uh, the Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania to um, retrofit um, a hemp home, which is what we're involved in, and also to conduct research and testing, which will support the, the acceptance of hemp lime to, um, into the International Construction Code. And we will also be testing for indoor air quality, uh, indoor um, environmental quality um, for our own research and, and promotion of this material. Next slide, please. So like in many post-industrial cities in the United States, there's many vacant balloon framed housing stock, uh, like Allison showed earlier, Don Services now has purchased this small, modest, but we kind of love it, um, house in the Lower East Side of Newcastle. And this will be the Project PA Hemp Home. Next slide, please. And the idea is to prototype the hemp line retrofit and create a demonstration that this can actually be done so that similar communities across the nation could do the same thing. Um, and, and so we'll do this and then it will be open for a while before the tenant moves in to actually be like kind of an open house and an experiential demonstration house. Next slide, please. So, you know, this method, as we're saying, is very new in the United States and it's been tackled by contractors like we see in um, with Cameron, but um, it's new to architects. So we've been working um, on the plans here. We've also been working with LTL architects on methods of drawing the hemp line in section. And so what does this actually look like in wall section? And here's some of their sketches. Next slide, please. So have, if you haven't already guessed, um, we are really encouraged and excited by the potential for Newcastle to prototype this hemp line affordable housing. Um, we're excited for the city of Newcastle um, and for the potential for this home to demonstrate healthier way forward for cities nationwide. Um, and we think this very well me a prescription for a healthier future, for renovating housing to be healthier, affordable, and made from locally sourced materials which invigorate the whole system of economies and workforce. Um, yeah, so this is a project that we're, we're, we're interested in. It's on the move, actually, that house is now under deconstruction and um, we'll be accepting its hemp lime, new insulation uh, of hemp lime in early April, which is, is we're very hopeful for spring. So we'll, we'll talk, next slide, we'll just talk a little bit about some other projects. Yeah, thank you, John Sarah. So um, one of our key um, activities in the lab is really to disseminate information about the work that we're doing, to advocate for change and to encourage all architects and designers to come on board with us to start at least asking that question of kind of what's inside the materials that you're specifying and start to work um, with industry to demand change. Um, this is a publication, an upcoming publication that was an outcome of a symposium that we ha held just over a year ago. And um, we hope will be a you know, contribution to knowledge in this space to share this with, with other architects. Um, and it was an event where um, I think there were 25 experts from a, a range of different fields, from toxicologists to architects, to innovators, material innovators, and uh, carbon thinkers came together to start to think about you know, how we could transform and define this, this area of material health. Uh, next slide, please. We know that um, architects and designers love images as we do and love to know what's going on. And so we use our Instagram platform um, with Facebook um, as a way of disseminating a kind of current, um, current projects within the lab ideas, um, that we're exploring other heroes in the space that we like to elevate for the work that they're doing in this same space. Um, and we'll, next slide, please. And we use our website too as a, a primary uh, platform dis uh, for disseminating the research that we're doing and the new knowledge that we're creating. In this case, it's some um, collections of healthier building products that have been evaluated by us. And um, when they have a yellow dot, they've been um, used in affordable housing. So it's a, um, it's a way for folks in affordable housing to be able to easier, 
easily access healthier materials. Next slide, please. And as John Sarah mentioned, we, we launched our first po podcast um, season last year, uh, finished the beginning of this year. It went on for longer than we thought it would because we were so excited about hemp, obviously. Um, but our second season upcoming in the summer is focused on, you would guess it, what would you guess? Plastics. So we were funded by a grant from the NEH um, to tell the story, the cultural history of plastics in the US and to think about kind of new futures that you know have less plastics in them. Um, and then if you sign up for our mailing list, next slide, um, you can hear about the, the events that we host through the lab. This was an event um, that we hosted last Thursday with our friends, Martha Lewis and Pele Munch Peterson, looking at this relationship between carbon and chemicals. Last slide. And you can find all of our resources on our website. Thanks very much for listening to us. Thank you, um, John Sarah. That was a really um, wonderful presentation. It's um, and full of full of hope, which is really encouraging. <laughs> but at the beginning, we were talking as we were getting set up about the challenges with um, finding all of these materials and uh, the the detective work that needs to happen. So, um, but I have to say this presentation has been, uh, has given us a lot of good leads as we move forward and particularly for my students as we move into the, to the rest of the semester. So thank you both. I just wanna, I will wanna ask a couple of questions and I know that um, the people joining us and welcome to all of you, we've got a great audience today, will have questions to ask. I first wanted to just quickly thank Lola for organizing these events. And it's her vision really for building science and technology here at GSAP that has brought such diversity to the tech sequence. And her beliefs align really closely with her own as teaching now. So there should be a purpose in the work and that people are really central to the work that um, we're both doing. So I think just to, um, to get started, even though you ended on such a high note, my first sort of question is, in the midst of so many uh, crises, how do we, uh, and when the inclination is to want to act, that there isn't enough time to think that we have, have to act, where do we start uh, to ensure that our space is healthier? And like, what is that road ahead like from this moment in time? Yeah. Maybe I'll just start. Um... It's a very good question. And, you know, I, I think that um, what we've found in our work is that these kinds of changes happen with a personal choice. Um, and so that personal choice begins with our own homes, you know, our own environments. And when you start to become conscious of everything that you're bringing into your life, into your own environment, into your own 90% of that exposome that you're experiencing, then you become conscious of the things you bring into your space. So, you make them, and then incrementally, you can make those choices healthier. I mean, we can consume less, first of all, but then, you know, as when we do need to bring new things, we can bring in healthier ones, like just simply healthier cleaning products, for instance, because cleaning products um, really can pollute our indoor air, and we're spending a whole lot of time inside lately. So understanding that, you know, healthier cleaning products don't come with those nasty chemicals in them, those nasty harmful chemicals is really important. Another simple thing we can do right now is take off your shoes when you come inside, because then you won't be bringing in things from the outside that might be toxic or, you know, potentially harmful for yourself or for your families um, indoors. And of course, opening windows and letting fresh air in, because now we understand that the outside air is cleaner than usually than our indoor air. And so ventilating is really important. I wonder if Alison, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we, we work with Mount Sinai, their envi environmental health um, group there, and they came up with this kind of nine first steps. We have them on our website. We can share them with you if you're interested. But it included those simple steps like taking off your shoes, opening the window, really thinking carefully about cleaning products and the HEPA filter in your vacuum cleaner. So those are th things we could all do 
if you're painting, look for an alternative paint, look for a, a lime based or other non acrylic paint, because paint covers so many surfaces in the space that you're in that, that um, it's a really simple way to transform your interior environment. We're also thinking again, um, as we think to the future, a project that we're working on with the MFA lighting program at, at Parsons is how we can retrofit our environments um, to combat future viruses. What, what can we do in our own environments to retrofit? And so one thing we're looking at now is the use of germicidal UV or UVC light that can be installed in existing light fixtures and works with ventilation within existing space. And that deact activates, kills the COVID virus. And so that's one of the projects that we are engaged, research projects that we're engaged with in right now and uh, all the way through to the summer, I think. And for us, the potential within affordable housing is profound, you know, because we think, we anticipate, and we hope that the uh, retrofitting of existing light fixtures could be something that is a very low cost um, uh, change to an existing fixture that will have this potential to be to make a radical change in in affordable housing. Right, if you speak in there, Alison, of affordable housing because that's really central to the work that you're doing at the lab. On the broader scale, then, you know, to transform those that market with healthier materials, and um, it seems like an onerous task. Is it, you know, is it doable? What are those steps for the designers and architects here today? Well, you know, where, where would their first steps be? Yeah, yeah, we, and Catherine knows this, we, we, we've uh, conducted uh, five case studies when we um, launched the lab to understand the current state of affordable housing in the country, again, to do that kind of systems diagramming that we're so interested in. And there are huge roadblocks in affordable housing to making change. And one is the financial structure, how we fund affordable housing. It's incredibly complex. And the construction costs, you know, with the soft costs of the regulations and the lawyers that are involved in the finance mechanisms, it ends up per square foot being more expensive to uh, design and build affordable housing than market rate housing. That seems absurd, right? So there's something wrong with that system where you're confronted with the roadblocks of money in a very kind of odd way. I also think we have to overcome structural racism Affordable housing, NYCHA housing that we know in New York City is built on the worst land in the, in the areas that are um, degraded environmentally next to highways, on you know, wetlands that have all kinds of problems um, that are underserved, that are under maintained. We need to, well, we advocate for healthier housing for everyone, that this is a this is a basic right of all of us living in this country and, and everywhere. So you know, confronting structural racism in our own work, understanding that affordable housing should look like housing, should be like housing, it shouldn't look like anything else, isn't any different, um, is I think a kind of mindset that um, will help us overcome some of the kind of intrinsic and, and really difficult challenges currently in that market. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that, that, you know, simple changes in material choice can do a whole lot. Like, you know, because it's affordable housing, most, um, most people involved making decisions want to shave costs at every turn. And they'll, they'll, so they'll shave, you know, a few dollars off a square foot by choosing a less expensive tile, you know, floor tile, for instance, um, using vinyl, for instance, instead of something a little bit more healthier. And what they're not looking at is the overall cost. So if we look at choosing a vinyl tile versus say a linoleum tile, which is linoleum, lino is, is, um, is from the, the flax plant, is from, lino is from linseed oil. And that's a flax plant. And that tile is maybe $4 more a square foot. Um, but over the lifetime of that product, it actually comes out to be about the same because it doesn't require the same kind of cleaning. It doesn't require the same kind of resurfacing. And overall, it doesn't require the same kind of health bills and emergency room visits to the overall community because it's not going to cause asthma to children or to, to adults. And so, you know, the way that we think about finance really has to be different. We have to think about the long-term. Um, so the, the long-term cost, which is about healthcare costs, 
It's also about cleaning costs. It's about maintenance costs. It's about people. And um, so, there, you know, there's some very basic changes that could happen very easily, um, which we don't need regulation for. We just need to be smarter about our own choices. You know, regulation takes a long time and we rely on other people to make those choices. But we actually have a lot of agency in our own choice. Great. That's the, that's the call to action we need to hear. I'm going to check with to see um, who'd like to ask a question if you uh, are able there's to. One, there's one question in the chat from Sam Newman. Um, how easily accessible is Hempline? How does cost compare to typical gypsum wool, uh, et cetera, benefits and disadvantages? And I might add that it we might not want to compare it to gypsum wool, but to whole like insulative infill. Um, yeah, so how- Yeah, you're, you're answering the question, Lola. <laughs> how easily accessible is Hempline? Well, you are developing the project in Western Pennsylvania. It's, so it's, it's really interesting to hear from you um, um, the accessibility of these uh, uh, materials elsewhere. So is it accessible now in all states in the US and what is the policy situation with material? Yeah, so we, talk, we talked about it a little bit, right? And, and you know, I think uh, John Sarah mentioned that, that most of the hemp herd is coming from France at the moment. And that's because it's a very new industry in the US. It's only since the 2018 farm bill that industrial hemp can be grown in this country. So there's a lot of kind of catch up to do in terms of the agricultural piece of it, the knowledge in terms of farming practices, and then in the processing processing of the stalk to, to get the herd. Because the herd has very particular proper, properties, it has to be processed in a way that retains those properties. So that when you mix it with the lime, which also has very particular properties, the combined, um, you know, the, the combined mix with water um, enables you to achieve um, the insulatory qualities, the flame retardant properties, the, um, the ability to modify and, and absorb and release humidity in the wall. So that's why people are relying on imported um, ingredients at the moment. Um, and they're readily available. You know, so they're pretty easy to import, right? But I would say that there are, um, they're becoming more, there are lime mixes now that are available from Pennsylvania and from Idaho. There are folks who are, are really, I mean, there's a lot of people, actually, there's um, a lot of people who are really dedicated to making this available in the United States in all different regions. And so uh, there's, a, there's an organization called the Hemp, uh, the US Hemp Building Association, which um, has regional groups and they're, each region is really promoting um, uh, you know, more uh, solutions to sources that are in their own region. And so, you know, the, the un end goal is to have it all be locally available wherever you are. Um, so it is, it is available now. And there are people who are distributing it in the US, which is really great. That wasn't true a few years ago. So, so that's pretty great. It's, it's, pretty, um, it's, it's pretty accessible. In terms of the question about the wall, it, it cannot, Lola started to answer that question because <laughs> We, you know, and I think Allison described this too, with, when she showed that, that, um, that layered, um, the look of the, you know, the, a wall section and that we have seven or more layers in a wall. This hemp lime substitutes those seven layers in actually just uh, three layers. It can be hemp lime in the middle as an insulation material, plaster on the interior and kind of a, a rougher kind of stucco on the exterior and that creates the wall section and the thicker that is the more insulatory it is and so we have to think about walls differently you know and you know it's it's kind of interesting too because you know the historical way of building walls was more similar to a hemp lime wall than it is to these seven layers that we've come across and then if we think about this whole discussion that's happening now of embodied carbon versus operational carbon what we realize is that this, the whole industry has pointed to operational carbon. And so the whole idea is like, let's keep the heat in, let's keep the cool in, let's not let there be too much exchange between outside and inside so that we can be more energy efficient. But actually the calculations say that the energy used to just make the building materials, not even talking about the health of the building materials, but just the energy used to make those building materials is far, far more 
then far more harmful and far more, um, you know, contributes far more to climate change than operational energy at all. In fact, Steve, I, yeah, yeah, Stephen's making some good points about, you know, that, that hempcrete is also a marvelous way to reduce embodied carbon. Yeah, exactly. It's through its through its life, except in the production of the lime. So when well, the, no, that's not true. Not true totally. <laughs> because <laughs> John Sarah is the lime expert here. <laughs> well, you know, and and there are new ways that mm. that lime is being produced. But the thing is, yes, limestone. I think I'm going to defend lime, but. It, you know, limestone, lime is produced by heating up limestone and limestone is 8% of the earth's crust. Like there's a lot of limestone on our planet. You heat up a piece of limestone. It has to get heated up to like 1200 degrees, something very high. That's a lot of energy. Yes. But lime reabsorbs the carbon it's, it's emitted even like maybe twice as much as is emitted over the course of its curing process. And it continues to absorb carbon over time. So that's where that's where I defend it. Yes, there's an initial um, emission of of carbon and energy taken to do that, but then it does reabsorb itself. And then together with hemp, which is a carbon sequester altogether, as a plant, it sequesters carbon like trees. Um, and but it then becomes it uses, a very carbon efficient material. Uh, then in use as part of that mix of hemp and lime, that wool wool section continues to absorb carbon dioxide over the life of the wool, which is kind of phenomenal. Stephen also had a question about local government. And I think the Pennsylvania project is really interesting because you see the power of uh, state governments to support the kind of activities that are happening in this project in Newcastle. So they're, they're, uh, um, they're hosting uh, grants for agriculture so that the, some of this testing, this new knowledge can be created through um, experimentation with seeds and um, uh, sowing uh, protocols and then harvesting. Industrial hemp is a, something of a kind of complicated plant to grow. And then they're also giving grants for construction and testing of new structures. So that seems like a very uh, a powerful way to support change and develop this kind of new hemp lime economy. We have a question too from um, Sammy and then Henry had his hand up so he might ask mm -hmm. his person but I can pass on Sammy's one first and um, he wanted to thank you first for all the work that you're doing and um, his biggest difficulty is in finding the time to find the healthier materials and to get his contractor on board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is time consuming. It's totally time consuming to find healthier materials. And, you know, that's that was the impetus for us to just list some of those that are proven to be healthier on our website. You know, we created these materials collections. Um, and I see that Layla is here, too. She's a senior researcher who really does an excellent job of curating um, those uh, materials that are, exist on that website to make sure that they definitely are healthier. They're just examples, really. You know, we've gone through the process. It is time consuming. This is a list of examples from each of these categories um, of materials that, that are healthier. Um, and you can do it too. And there, there are some other ways that you can evaluate. And, you know, there's just some basic thumbnail ways that you can, you, you can find a healthier material. And one is, what are its ingredients? They just ask, like, what's it made of? And that's becoming easier to find out. There are something, there's something called the health product declaration or a declare label. And both of these labels list the ingredients of a building material. So, and they're pretty quick to find. You could find that information in about five minutes. Once you look at those ingredients though, you have to make the evaluation. Is this okay or is this not okay? You know, it's, it's, like, it's, the, it's like that common sense. If you can't pronounce it and if it has like, lots of polymers in it, you might consider a different material. You know, and, and that's, yeah. Yeah, Go so ahead. the interesting thing about our materials collections too is it is a great resource. Like if you don't have the time to do that fundamental research and it takes hours and hours and hours to evaluate one product. So you could use our materials collections in that way as a resource for you. And the benefit of using our materials collections, not to sell them, you know, whatever, but it's um, that all of the materials that we um, evaluate have been installed, have been specified and installed and specified and installed sometimes in affordable housing. And that for us is critically important. We're not really interested in being on the, on the bleeding edge of, of 
product use without having any kind of experience using a product. So, I mean, that's the contractor question, you know, that's the, the challenge for contractors is when you say, we have this great new product, this lime paint, and he says, well, how do you install it? How do I paint with it? Is it gonna perform in the way that my acrylic paint works? Um, and no, it's not going to be quite the same way as installing. And it's going to be different from the acrylic, but it's going to hold up in the space in a, in a different kind of way that is, you know, that, that as a performing, as a performance issue is absolutely comparable in terms of performance, but superior in terms of kind of health outcomes. Mm -hmm. I see there's a question in the chat here about hemp lime as an insulation. Hemp lime is an insulation material. That's what it, that's its performance quality. It's, it's insulation. It's not structural, it's insulation. And it's a breathable insulation. So it allows, um, and because of the lime in a big way, it, it actually absorbs, um, it absorbs air from both the inside and the outside air. And it's, and it regulates in between. And that's how it acts as an insulation material. So it's, and it absorbs toxics from the, in, from the air. So like an interior, it actually absorbs toxics. It absorbs humidity when it's too humid, releases humidity when it's um, too dry inside. And there's, and there's an air exchange. So um, some people want, you know, that's why we use the word hemp lime instead of hempcrete, because mm. we don't want to confuse people to think it's like concrete. It is not like concrete. It is not structural. Mm -hmm. I think the name was given, I think because when it's wet, the consistency when it's wet is a little bit like concrete, although it's very much, it's very lightweight, whereas concrete's obviously very heavy, but you can use a concrete mixer, like in its wet state, it feels more like you can deal with it like concrete, but it's nothing like, it doesn't perform anything like concrete, nothing mm -hmm. actually opposite. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, like, I guess yeah, I was, like, oh, sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to follow up because I asked that question, but I, I was wondering, I guess I, um, was wondering because in the wall section that we saw in the presentation, I did see insulation. And so that's kind of why I asked, I saw insulation in addition to the hemp lime. So, hmm. so I think you saw the hemp lime blocks in the, in the sketch detail. Yeah, I thought I saw an insulation uh, hatch. I think it was just the hemp lime blocks. You know, what we were experimenting with is um, precast hemp lime materials with wet kind of spray applied or form applied. And mm -hmm. we're, com we're experimenting with combining those two. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is dealing with hemp lime is that it takes a long time to dry, a very long time. It takes all that time to absorb the carbon back into itself from, from the air. And so, and that's what cures it. And so that process can take six or eight weeks depending on the thermal or climate conditions of where you are. So one of the ways to make that much quicker is to precast materials, precast a block or precast a panel, let it dry in the factory, bring it on site, and then it's our, it's like a building material, it's ready to go. And so, but you know, getting that full thickness that you need is much easier to do if you're spraying. So we thought it would be good to combine that. You know, if you put a precast material, say on the inside and you spray from the outside, you can get that wall thickness, but you can also continue construction on the interior without waiting for it to dry. So maybe that's what you were seeing. I, I don't know. But it's a super important maybe, question. Yeah. yeah, because that is why, you know, many oh. people are looking to hemp lime as, as an alternative to traditional insulation. And I see uh, Stephen also in there. So one of, the testing, one of the tests that's happening right now is to say, you know, how deep should that wall be? What's the R value I can expect from this, from this 12 inch wall or this 10 inch wall? And then, actually being able to demonstrate that you're getting that insulatory value for the wall. So, you know, this is early days in some ways in the US for exactly determining, it's not like slapping up a piece of styrofoam or fiberglass insulation where there is a predictive range of insulatory value there. This is slightly more exploratory at this moment in time. And so those standards have to be established so that you can say, well, a 10 inch wall is going to give you an R value of blah, if it's detailed in this way, or if it's 12 inch, it'll be this. So, you know, again, this is work that will happen definitely on the PA house that we're working on. That's the kind of testing we'll do. Um, and then we'll have evidence of, you know, hemp and lime used in a renovation project, which will be great, I think. 
Okay, um, I'll just, Henry had his hand up there. Henry, did you yes. want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you very much, Alison. Just thought it was really interesting. Um, I had a good question. I, I thought it was interesting, the kind of case study with paints returning to kind of water and natural pigments, and obviously the case study with hemp line. And I apologize to Catherine and my peers because I'm always banging on with the same kind of question. But with Newcastle, this case study where there is a high degree of resiliency by having a regional economy that's then feeding new healthy material. Mm. How do you view as directors of the lab this question of scalability, right? Because you know, some of these new toxic chemicals were added to materials in terms of performance. Performance becomes to a certain extent an economic measure. So you have corporate consolidation. So comparing the hemp lime to Dow Chemical and their insulating foam panels. Um, it's obviously very important to have these kind of pilot projects. When we think about a market like New York, where there's huge volumes of construction. And the question is, how do you break down the supply chains to allow a better material to become as ubiquitous as these hugely ossified and very rigid supply chains that exist because of mostly bad actor materials? Mm -hmm. And so specifically, I guess my question is, as director of the lab, I know you're doing a lot already, but how do you envision the process after these kind of pilot projects for diverse materials to scale up? Because mm -hmm. it's something that we talk about a lot in the class, what are the barriers yeah. and stresses on getting healthy materials out there? And I'm wondering how much work you're doing to kind of think about those timelines and roadmaps to kind of work inside of those processes. Mm -hmm. All the time, that's where we start. I mean, we don't want to be, I, I make this joke all the time, we don't want to be the hippie architects who are interested, you know, with the Birkenstocks and the mud brick houses and all of that. We really are interested in transformation. And the only way we can do that is if we propose scalable solutions. So that is something, you know, that led us to this idea of constructing hemp line blocks that are similar in size to a concrete block that, can I talk about this? <laughs> okay, well, anyway, um, uh, yes. innovating, in, innovating in production using existing um, industries that are underutilized. So that kind of product development piece of this is incredibly important because if you can factory produce something, you can produce at scale and you can reduce the price and you can make it available. Um, uh, all over the country. The other thing that we're interested in is supply chains that we work regionally. Agricultural is a regional activity. And so for us, it's really thinking about creating these regional centers of production, not only of the growing the industrial hemp, but processing the lime and then putting those two materials together to make a range of products and then serving your region rather than it being a kind of national distribution system. But that's a political choice, you know, as for us, as much as a, as a scalable kind of option for, for making change. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, we, there's a couple other ingredients into making scale, which is optimism, <laughs> believing that it can happen. And, um, you know, having this kind of vision and then gathering people to just come on board. And, you know, I think that the, the hemp lime or, you know, they, a lot of people call it the hemp Creek kind of revolution has really, is really escalating just even in the last, you know, became legal to farm hemp in December of 2018. And now there are regions, there are people organized. There's a lot of motion towards making this happen. And if you think of who started Dow chemical in the first place, I actually don't know who, who the, the, the person is, but you know, it starts with this idea that it can happen. And we really believe it can happen. And we believe that invigorating people to work in fields and, and soil and plants versus working in chemical factories, like the one that we've shown some photographs of, is, a, is culturally a much better future for our culture. And so you know, we have to demonstrate that it can happen and we, we know that we have the technology that, that will make it happen. We also actually, we, we didn't show slides, but we visited places in Europe where um, hemp has been farmed for many, many years, many more years. And we saw these precast products being produced with robots actually in, in Europe in different parts of Europe and by hand in different technologies, um, industrial, you know, like kind of industrial processes that have been developed over, like Alison saying, that have been developed over the last hundred years that are being retrofitted to accept hemp lime as a material or as brand new processes that require robotic arms to make these hemp creep, hemp lime, you know, building products. So 
you know, the scale has been proven in our eyes. It just hasn't yet been adopted in the United States. But there's a lot of knowledge transfer to happen from other parts of the world. You know, like in China, for instance, they've been planting and, and harvesting hemp for hundreds of years. And they never had a, it never became illegal and, you know, equated with marijuana and stopped like it did in this country. And so they have this kind of depth of knowledge about how to actually work with the plant. So yes, we believe it. And we have to remain optimis, optim, you know, optimistic that it can happen. Well, for us also, scalability e equates with affordability, and that's the bottom line for us. We're also not interested in creating solutions that only a few people can afford. That, that's not our mandate. That's not what we're interested in doing. We're interested in creating a productive, you know, valuable economies, but in a different kind of way so that there are affordable products that could be used in, in everyone's house, not just in the houses of people who can afford it. I have a question related to that. Sorry, Catherine. No, no, go ahead. Um, first, of course, thank you for this super inspiring presentation. And, um, and thank you for doing this work of converging policy with, uh, you know, hands-on and really uh, um, theoretical studies also in, in, with chemistry and biology and human health and uh, um, affordability. Uh, taking all of this together and uh, of course, the focus on the retrofit and weatherization of existing buildings. This is seminal, this is so important. So thank you. Um, uh, so a question about this um, um, uh, this point that you just made, Alison, that I completely agree with that it's really to make a viable, uh, uh, sustainable, healthy building solution the industry should be uh, in place, or, or there, there should be uh, an economic, a financial incentive. Um, and of course, the building policy should be also uh, there for this. Um, and my question relates to, of course, to clay, which is one of my mm. uh, main materials used in, uh, in the area of, you know, earth and bio-based uh, and natural building materials that are part of my research. And specifically, my question relates to materials that can be mined and curated directly from nature. I call it sometimes farmed building mm -hmm. or in other yeah, words. You said the same. <laughs> <laughs> so non-commodified, right? Mm -hmm. Non-commodified building materials that cannot be uh, uh, patented or uh, mm -hmm. cannot, cannot be so easily made into building products to inform a new industry. How do we tackle these materials? Because very similar to lime, clay is a natural binder that does not require any heating at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I see Jansara talk about lime and I, I, I feel how I am talking about clay with this passion about its hydrothermal properties and uh, its lending abilities and how it uh, is a natural binder, um, uh, which is permeable and breathable. And um, so how do we use, uh, um, uh, how do we develop a model for non-commodified building materials? Well, I think, you know, I, you, you raise a great question. For us, we talk about plant and mineral-based building products, and that's a whole suite of materials that um, are being explored by a bunch of different people in different areas of the world. And, you know, if we think of alternative models of production, the bespoke handmade house that uses the clay from the site that is built by the owner of the land, you know, with their friends um, that creates a sustainable, healthy place to live is part of that vision. I think it's not that we're necessarily looking at creating new products and creating wealth, it may be wealth for some people, not for the people, not like Dow Chemicals, the devils. You know, we, we are interested in, uh, you know, alternative economic models. And so I think you bring up a very good point. I think Chris, um, Stephen Stewart mentioned Chris Magwood and Chris Magwood talks about, you know, this space, you know, he talks about plant-based and also mineral-based products in a, in a much more holistic way. We focused on hemp and lime because we think, you know, because there's a lot of stuff to do out there, but we think there are opportunities there where we could develop models and then also look at other kinds of plant and mineral based um, ingredients and look at analogous aligned parallel or 
reciprocal kind of um, evolution of building products that is part of this new suite of the anti-DAO kind of product, the opposite of what we have now. Right. I remember Chris in, in the podcast hosted by you, he talks about tomato stalks and yep. um, uh, sunflower, sunflower stalks. Stalks, yeah. stalks. So all these small scale local mm -hmm. resources, right, that we can, uh, um, and right, the, the smaller scale we, we get, the, the more uh, socially sustainable we, mm -hmm. we essentially are. Well, Alex Sparrow speaks about that too, you know, who's a big hemp lime guy in, in the UK. He talks about learning from our place. And that has been historically the way we've built. We learn, we use the materials that are around us, that surround us. We build knowledge over time. And then we build with those materials and that knowledge and that creates a sustainable building and construction system. Yeah. I mean, it has yeah. to be that way. Why do we want to be shipping all these odd things all over the place? Right. And using sure. people, you know, using people's knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. farming is not easy. It's, it's not simple. And, you know, mining also, you know, mining of clay, mining of these things mm -hmm. requires technology, knowledge, knowledge of people in their hands and their, mm -hmm. their minds and different kind of knowledge than we're getting at these higher education systems. And so, you know, working with people who have these, this knowledge to make economies that will support their you know, their, you know, um, generations of knowledge and the support local the communities. Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, it actually supports everyone versus the other model, which is, you know, this kind of proprietary model that happens in these, you know, caged factories. Extractive and racist and yeah, mm -hmm. not sustainable. No. Right. Yeah. They, um, we're coming up to just, we've gone way over, which is no surprise because the conversation has been so great. Um, but I just want to finish on one question that I think can be very quickly answered. Um, they, Aditi um, had, was wondering about potential maintenance issues, mm. but I wonder with these heritage materials if actually they're so durable, there aren't those um, typical maintenance issues we might encounter. Yeah, I think it's, you know, as John Sarah, you have another presentation. I do. I yeah. do. I need um, to... <laughs> uh, I'm I talking think... to interior designers today too, architects <laughs> and interior designers, because we have to work together, actually. We have to work closely together to make this big change. Yeah, so repairing hemp line. Hemp line, as it, as it ages, the line becomes harder and harder. John Sarah says it returns to its limestone-like, stone-like um, features. So the exterior walls in particular become more and more inert and harder and harder. So they become very, very durable. Similarly, on the inside, those walls are very durable. And so I think you can patch, you know, with, with lime and hemp, like patching if you needed to, but the wall itself is becoming a better product the more it's in the world, which is kind of the opposite of these other products. As with um, linseed oil paint too, it yes. kind of matures over time. Okay, and I would just you. add one other piece to that. Like sure. it depends on the, the way that you're plastering. So like on interiors, mm -hmm. if you plaster in a way that uh, burnishes that lime plaster, it can become waterproof. Mm -hmm. You know, it can become much, much more durable. Like again, on ancient methods, if we look at ancient methods of tatalic, for instance, that comes out of Morocco, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compressed lime plaster. It, it's a, it's a, a wall that becomes almost stone-like and water repellent just on its own. So um, burnished with some soap. So um, then you can wipe it. You can wipe it down all the, all you want. If you use something like lime wash, which all of you could use on the rest of your projects for the rest of your life, then the way to clean it is really with more of a brush, you know, a dry brush or a dry rag, not with water. Um, so the maintenance just changes, our behavior changes. So I had to just pop that in there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's important. And um, okay, I just to thank you again. I um, make it. I want you to realize that I think it was Stephen who had to jump off, and he said, "Been on the Health Materials website." He felt like a kid in a candy store, so that's very exciting. <laughs> I hope he visits often. But to thank you both, um, Lola for organizing it, and um, Alison and John Sarah for a really thought provoking um, presentation. It's I just wanted to say exciting.
Yeah, I'm Ella Long from the MARC program at GSAPP. So I'm so happy to be with you all. It was really, it's a great joy for me to, to present our material to you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much, Thank you. Alison. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon. So my own students will reconvene on our other Zoom link, I think. Okay, see you guys in a couple of minutes. We'll just take a couple of minutes.